First of all, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I think the conference, from everything that I've read about it, looks like a great group of discussions. And I'm going to start you off. That's a good ring. I'm going to start you off this morning, this afternoon, talking about emerging devices um, and talking about a lot of things that we're focused on inside of AT&T and I think where the industry is going. So first of all, before I start, anybody see our earnings announcement this morning? Okay, so we had our earnings announcement this morning, and I'm very proud to say that uh, a lot of the discussion was about what I'm going to talk about. And, and when I get asked all the time, in fact, I was having a conversation with my mother the other day, and she's asking me kind of what I do. She doesn't get it. And I said, Mom, let, what, read the earnings. That, that won't work. And bottom line is what we're trying to do is create a whole new space. And if you look at what we've uh, called my little talk this morning is about what's the next big thing. Um, and, and when you look at the wireless space, I imagine if I asked you a quick question, how many people in the room have had a wireless phone for more than 10 years? How about, how about, is anybody in the room, did anybody, because by the way, the, the wireless phone was born where? Here, right, 1985, uh, and so it's, it's about a 25-year-old industry. How many have had one for 20 years? Okay, so bottom line is, is, is it's changed a little over that time. And what I want to talk about uh, is what is the next big thing, but more so when you start talking about what the next big thing is in the wireless space, you got to ask yourself a question, is, and, and you got to have a quick little lesson of history is where we come from. How do we get where we are right now? Because the wireless business has changed dramatically. And I think all of you in this room have experienced that. You can argue it's changed dramatically in the last couple of years. But when you go back to 1985, all the way through, I started in the business in 1990. So I'll be actually my 20th anniversary in this business is next month. And so I've been around for enough to see a lot of what's changed. And really important is you got to kind of think where we, where we came from. So for those of you that had a phone 20 years ago, what'd you pay for it? Yeah, actually 20 years ago, if you got a phone for 300, I knew we need to chat. Because 20 years ago, 1990, I was selling that phone right in the middle, that big brick. Remember the old Motorola brick phone? I was selling that. I was a sales rep in 1990 for $1,000. In fact, I was so proud of my sales that my first month on the job, my quarter was four. And, I, and, I, and I'm very proud to say I sold more than four. And we even, at that time, what do you think you paid for a minute back then? You paid a buck a minute, right? So if you had a $60 rate plan back then, you had paid for 60 minutes. Was there nights and weekends and rollover and free mobile, the mo all that stuff wasn't around because at that time, our penetration rate was low, the business was brand new, and but guess what? What were the wireless carriers doing at that time? Making lots of money. Right? Learning the business, growing the business, right? Building cell. And all of a sudden, if you look at this progression of what's happened, everything's changed. And why has it changed? And it's at the top of the slide. Competition, the value in the business, technology innovation have driven this industry to where, for those of you who may have even read the original business plans at the, around, around the FCC and back in the day, said if we get 10% penetration in the US, would be shocking. They were talking about 1 in 2% penetration in the U.S. When Craig McCaw first got involved, and I started from McCaw Communications, you know, it was like, if we can get to 10% penetration, this is going to be unbelievable. What's our penetration right now? Yeah, closing it. Yeah, uh, Actually, after, the, after Verizon goes tomorrow, I think we're going to see we're closing on 100%, and I have a slide to look at that. What I want to point out, though, is where we've come from, and what's very important to think about is, does anybody remember the first time they heard, well, data's happening, data's now, it's going to happen next year. When did that start? About 10 years ago, exactly. And by the way, 10 years ago, I was one of the guys, because I'm kind of a geek, and I really like this stuff. I was trying to, I remember this, I went into my, my boss's boss's boss and tried to sell putting a modem pool in. Remember that, that term? Anybody know what a modem, that's so, there were so many different types of modems, you put on the switch, Obviously, I would have, well, I'm glad we didn't do it because it wouldn't have been there very long. But the point being is, is we've seen just an unbelievable change. Let me show you another chart. This chart's a fun one, too. Um, and the reason I put it up, so when I started in 1990, penetration was about 5%. And then look at how it grew, right? They're saying right now that by 2013, we're going to beat 107%. Does anybody believe that's the right number? Okay, so if, if that number happens, I will be coming to you for a new job because I won't have a job because I actually believe penetration could be five, six, seven hundred percent because when they did this chart, they were thinking about 
postpaid, prepaid, and wholesale, they weren't thinking about connected devices. They weren't thinking about wirelessly enabling everything, which I'm going to get into in detail. The one thing that's fun about this chart, though, is when you think back to that, and you can look back when you got your first phone and say, wow, well, if there's only 13% penetration, you know, the networks were very different. The technologies were very different, right? Obviously, you're hearing a lot about this massive growth. And my, and my, this slide here is one of my favorite slides. Why? Because this is AT&T's mobile broadband growth. Okay, let me give you a number that you can remember. In the last three years, three years, we've had 5,000% growth in mobile data usage. By the way, again, 10 years ago, we were talking about the next year's a year of data. Guess what? The data's here. My whole job is about data, not about voice. It's about how do we grow the data business. You can see this chart. The f I know what you're all thinking. You're going, wait a second. Well, you launched the iPhone three years ago. That's a big part of it, right? Steve Jobs and his team, when they, when they came to us the first time and we started talking about what he can deliver, he delivered exactly what he said he was going to deliver, which was a game-changing device, a game-changing ecosystem around the device with the App Store. But more importantly for you to think about, when you look at this, this is what's driven and what will continue to drive our industry. It's all about data. And that's what we're going to get into. So, if that's the history, so what do I do every day? And why is it important? What's the next big thing? The next big thing is as simple as this. Wirelessly enabling anything that has a current running through it. And, and I'll get into some more detail, but more importantly, the history of my group is very simple. Randall Stevenson, who's our chairman, got a hold of this device, and it was called the Amazon Kindle. Anybody have a Kindle? Okay, if your Kindle's older than about three months, you need a new Kindle. Because the old one's on Sprint and the new one's on us, but we'll go there in a minute. Um, and the new one works so much better. Um, now, what happened was, is Randall got all the Kindle and said, this is cool. I, mean, I, I can do a lot of things here. First of all, why isn't our network? And that was before I was in my role. And second of all, if this is cool and this device is, what's going to happen with other devices? So what he did is ask a bunch of our smart uh, strategy folks and said, look, let's go do a bunch of research. And he did that. Uh, and I was brought in, and obviously my group was formed in 2008, really the end of 2008. And the focus was really simple, and you can read it. I'm not going to go and, and drain the slide, but it's really to go out and change this industry. Okay, we, we just talked about we have what penetration? Close to 100%. So if there's anybody in the room who's an analyst, I don't think there isn't today, but they started asking questions about six months ago, right, and said, look, AT&T, you're a $125 billion company and your growth engine's mobility, and the penetration rate is 100%. How are you going to grow? What, what's, what's the next thing that's going to drive your, your revenue growth? By the way, we had phenomenal revenue growth this morning, um, which we can discuss if you'd like when we do Q&A. But point being is that question is a very relevant and good question. By the way, that's a very relevant and good question for anybody who's in the mobility business. Because reality is, for all of you who are users, right? You're going to want to get a new phone here and there, but if anybody knows any $100 mobility users that don't have a phone today, let's talk. But I don't know of any. Even my 13-year-old my daughter is a, is, a, is a massive user. She does about 8,000 text messages a month. She's phenomenal. How many, how many of you guys have one of those? I got, mine's great. Mine sits in the back seat with her friends, and they text because they don't want me to hear what they're talking about. <laughs> they don't even talk. They just text. I go, why don't you call that person? She goes, why would I do that? Right? different world. That's our, by the way, that's our future customer, right? Those 13, 14-year-olds, my son's 16, they don't even look at this thing the same way we do. Which, by the way, we need to make sure we understand. And what I'm going to talk about where our, this next big thing is really, in a sense, focused at them. They see it. I handed my son the iPad, right? I said, Mitch, what do you think? Within 12 seconds, right, he's an iPhone user. He had that thing going and on and doing. They go, Dad, this isn't bad. You know, I like it. You know, I hand it to my wife, and she goes, what's that? Right? Very different mentality. Um, also very important that I want to make sure the point I make is the last bullet. I get asked every day, and I literally every day, how have you made the iPhone and the relationship with Apple work? I want to go on record here, and I do this all the time. Apple is a phenomenal company, and they're actually good to work with. People go, come on. You're supposed to say that. It's true. 
Okay, the iPhone would not be as successful as it is if we weren't great partners, if we weren't trusted partners, if we weren't willing to call each other and make changes. And I've learned a lot from that. I've been involved from day one with them. A big part of what my group does and we have to do is have long-term relationships, whether that's with Sony, LG, or it's with the small company. And I'm going to talk about a few of our relationships because reality is it's all about relationships and growing this business because it's going to change every single day. Okay, and if you know, it's not just about big AT&T pounding on somebody saying, well, this is what we need you to do. It's about having trusted partnerships. Here is the slide that says, this is really big. And you can, if you look to the right, there's a couple of numbers that have come out recently. So think about this. First, let me ask a question. How many in the room have bought an electronics product in the last year? Best Buy, Walmart, Radio Shack, you go walk in there. So next time you're in Best Buy, Next time you're in Walmart and you walk into the Connection Center, next time you're in Radio Shack, find a device that wouldn't be better if it was connected. Now, when I say connected, don't automatically think web, okay? Think about devices working with other devices. So today, is anybody in the room, and I know the answer is no, have a device like your iPhone or your Blackberry, but, and you all have probably, many of you probably have a screen in your car. Do they work together? No. Should they? Of course they should. Right? Think about the connectivity between devices and think about the connectivity of the web. Think about app stores and SDKs and all those fun things. But that's what we're talking about here. You can't find a device that wouldn't be better if it was connected, wouldn't have more value, right? wouldn't allow you more flexibility as a consumer, small, medium, large business, government entity, doesn't matter. And that's what this is talking about. So if you look to the right on the bullets, you'll see some pretty crazy numbers. Right? You've got Ericsson's CEO came out and said, I see 50 billion, okay, with a B, 50 billion connected devices by 2020. Think about that for a second. Then the next number you start doing math on, right? This is a Cisco C CTO. Now, the Cisco CTO has some, some gain here, right? I see a trillion connected devices by 2013. Okay, now, by the way, if those numbers come true, I'll have a great job. That's really good. I don't know if they're right or wrong. What I do know is they're really big. And the reality is, is this is the next big space for the mobility business. By the way, think about the ecosystem. It's the next big space for consumer electronics. It's the next big space for anybody that builds a chip, Intel, Qualcomm, Ericsson. It's the next big space if you're in the content business, because now you're going to build content that goes across multiple devices. Think about your life for a second. I'm going to show you a chart that will go through and kind of give you the idea. By the way, there's some other numbers up there on revenue and all, because the first question we get asked is, and is, well, wait, so in fourth quarter, Glenn, you guys did a million plus devices. What's the revenue? What's, what's... It's not as simple as what's the revenue in ARPU, because every single vertical is different. Every device is different, and I'll go through that. So here is my favorite chart, and, and this, is a, this is not all, but this is a subset of what we're working on. Okay? And when you look at this chart, think about your life. Think about how you operate every single day and what you do. You wake up, you know, I, I don't know about you, but I usually need coffee, and then I get in my car, and all the things you do, you go to work, and you think about what would touch your life here. Okay? Whether it's an e-reader, e-readers are getting a lot of press. And by the way, just because the iPad launched, does that mean Amazon's not going to do well? No. Because there's enough of a space between what a Kindle does and somebody who says, I just want a reader. I just want a black, that's all I want. And for 200 bucks, I'm willing to buy that. Versus somebody going and buying an iPad versus somebody going and buying a tablet or slate computer, which by the way, those are gonna be on fire by holiday, okay? So they're all very different and there's space for all of them. Go to the left, PNDs. I talked about your car. Our cars today are not very smart. Okay, the future of, a, of the smart car is a very cool place. So I may ask another question. So I've got, I'll use me, I've got two kids. When I'm in my car driving with my 16 and 13 in the back seat, what do I want in the front seat? I think based on where you live, you want real-time traffic, right? You want to know exactly, right? By the way, nobody in the United States today offers real-time traffic. Many claim it, but it's not real-time. It's not to that second. We're building it, and we will offer it, okay? You want diagnostics. Wouldn't it be great if your mechanic called you and said, we're seeing something kind of weird in your car, why don't you bring it in on Tuesday? Versus you breaking down on the side of the road. Okay, that's not, that's happening today and will happen more in the future. Okay, safety and security. That's the front seat. What do the kids want in the back seat? They want everything. 
entertainment, internet, everything. The car is two places. The car companies have a bit of a problem. Car companies, what, what's, their, what's their innovation cycles today? About four years. So what's in your vehicle today was thought of four years ago. How quick is my industry changing? Every day. So we're trying to work with them and help them with that. They've got to fix that to get really to a true smart car. If you go into computing, you get the idea. Every computer in America should have Wi-Fi. How many of you seven years ago paid extra for Wi-Fi? You don't have that computer anymore, but you did. Why is Wi-Fi involved, included in every device? Because the chipset's four bucks. Okay, wide area network, 3G technology should be in every computer going forward. And we're working with all the OEMs on that. And you can keep going, right? Digital cameras, camcorders, the ability to actually get your pictures out of jail. Think about that for a second. Today, we don't do a very good job of it. Tomorrow, we will. And if you keep going around, gaming, healthcare. The healthcare space is an incredible space. We've broken into two things. We've broken into e-wellness, and we've broken into e-health. E-health is more critical care. Anybody an attorney in the room? You guys, I've got multiple chasing me, okay? And if I go do critical care, I get lots of help. So we're kind of, that's a little bit longer pull in the, in the tent. But when you think about e-wellness, I'll show you a device we launched just at CTIA that we've, we've talked about. There's lots of opportunity. And you keep going, smart metering, I think most people know about. We're very heavily engaging, gaming, tracking devices, tablets, you get the idea. This is a very small subset, and we're just scratching the surface of what you can wirelessly enable and what that then can do in working either with the internet or other devices. Okay. So what does my group do and what makes us a little different? I'm going to go into a couple of devices. Now, when I put this on the board, you all chuckle. I hear it, right? Let me ask a question. How many people in the room have a dog? Come on, raise your hands high, be proud. How many of you actually like your dog? I've got a dog and I don't like him. His name's Sammy, okay? And Sammy was not wanted by dad in the house, but I was outnumbered, right? And when Sammy came home, I just made one rule. If he bites the couch, Sammy leaves and Sammy hasn't been the couch. Point being is, my 13-year-old daughter loves Sammy. And if, when I launch this product, do you think I'm gonna buy it? Because if I don't, and Sammy gets lost, then who's the bad guy? Me. By the way, I'll give you some quick stats. 27 million Americans wrote on a piece of paper in a survey, they treat their dog as well as their children. 27 million. By the way, there's probably 10 million more that just didn't write it. Okay, so, what, so my point here, and this is really just one way of showing an application for a small wireless module that has GPS in it, this is a real business. Today, you can't get this. There's only one company out there, it's very expensive, doesn't work very well, and they're not using our wireless technology, they're using a different band of spectrum. This is really showing what a module that big, put two quarters together, right, has GPS, can be vertically integrated to a website, you can on your iPhone in two seconds see where that module is. What if that module cost $100? What would you strap it to? What if the module cost $50? What wouldn't you strap it to? Think about all the applications. I, my 13-year-old daughter comes to mind, actually, <laughs> right? So I'm one application, right? How about parcels, packages, containers in, in the business world? How about fleet services? I show this one because, believe it or not, when we do surveys with people, this is very, very important to people. They want to be able to find FIDO. The cool thing, too, is, is guess how much network this uses? Doesn't use it unless FIDO's lost. Okay, my network people like that. I like the revenue and, and OBITA that brings to the business. But again, this is a great example. By the way, we did launch this at CTIA. We, we, we will launch it, the device itself, this year. This company is, Aposphere is a small company. One thing I should point out. I set a, a tone inside of this group. One of the things about being AT&T and being as big as we are, it was very important to me when we went out in this marketplace that I've, we talk to everyone. So imagine, I've been out, right? we've gotten a lot of press. My, my business development group is run by a gentleman named Dave Hay. He has been asked by me to talk to everybody. If I get an email from you and you have an idea, we will talk to you. If I get an email from you and you have a device and you are two guys or two guys in a gal in a garage with duct tape, we're going to meet with you. By the way, that's how we find these. And what I found is the small business owner, the very, very small, the great innovations, even if they can't deliver, I'll help them deliver because we're finding some incredible innovations with small business owners. 
Aposphere is a company that's going to build a dog collar. Their next product is actually going to be a golf-related product for those of you out there that like to do that and want to know how far your ball is from the hole. They're going to have a product for you. Okay, they want to then expand to pallets. They call it people, pets, and pallets. Great. It, bottom line is, is the opportunities are virtually endless. Next product, Visit, is, is a product we have launched. It is in the marketplace. You can go buy it today. It's by a small company of 11 people out of Boston called Isabella. We met Matthew, who's the CEO. This, this gentleman had a vision, right? His vision was real simple. We, the picture frames of today are garbage. The cameras today don't connect to anything, and I can't get my pictures out of jail. So what he did is he built a back room. I'll tell you something. If you haven't seen this, the back room of the visit, the frame's beautiful, and it's nice, and it looks good. What's really slick is the back room is connected to all the social networking. So whether you have Flickr or you're big on, if you, my kids are big on Facebook and all that, this allows you to bring all that together on, in his back room, allows me, for instance, I've got, my parents just retired, they moved to Arizona, and if I send them anything that's, that's electronic and needs a little work, it ain't gonna be used. I can set this frame up from the web. I can control the pictures on the web. I can actually make it so when my mom receives a picture of my son playing soccer, and wants to pass it to her sister, it's two touches on that screen. And she can do it. It's virtually, virtually brainless and beautiful because it then allows also to connect to all the pictures you may have on the, on the internet. He's done a phenomenal job. This, this is in the marketplace and he's a very small. We only found him because we said, look, we're talking to everybody. He actually went to one of my competitors and they didn't even return his call. And I think it's one of the most innovative things I've seen. This is called Zebo. This is also a small company. This company is really funded by Qualcomm. In fact, Paul Jacobs himself is very, very excited about what Zebo is doing. Basically, think about a Wii or a PS3, but for the lower income side of the world. They've already launched in South America. They've launched in Brazil and Mexico. And the idea here is to put a device in someone's home where they may not have Wi-Fi, right? People usually think, well, it's just easy. Everybody's got Wi-Fi. Not everybody has Wi-Fi, by the way. This allows them to have that choice. It also gives them the ability to bring in education, games, and basically have a gaming device in the home that they probably couldn't do when it comes to this, the cost of the Wii or the cost of the PS3 and having Wi-Fi in the home. Um, they're doing extremely well in their launch. I'm very excited about this product. I think it's got a, a huge opportunity as we move forward. And again, Zebo is a very small company. It's a very, very small group of people, and Qualcomm's been helping them out. Here's our e-wellness device. Uh, if you haven't seen this, um, you can read the, the bullets. It's this simple. It's, it's a glow cap. It's a company called Vitality. This reminds you to take your medication. It's just that simple. Okay? You can see the picture. The glow cap goes on. There's a puck that goes in your home that's a light. So let's say you put that in your kitchen or your bathroom. It allows you, for me, to see if my mom and dad took their medication today. It allows the doctor to see if it's in medication today. It reminds them both visually and with a tone to take their medication, okay? Now think about the ecosystem that we're talking about here. Pharmaceuticals, first of all, if you ask doctors about our aging society, one of the biggest issues, they don't take their medication, which forces them to come do what? Go see the doctor again. Pharmaceutical companies think this is pretty cool because they sell more medication, right? So it kind of hits the whole ecosystem. I think it's really cool because I want to know what's going on with my loved one. That's where I think the greatest part is. By the way, if you look at the last bullet, it can be set up to have automatically renew your prescriptions. It can do a lot of things. It's, this is what I love about this. It's a simple solution that, to a very big problem. Okay, and there are going to be others, right? You've probably all read about there's some technology out there where people are going to put actual radios on each pill, right? That's happening, by the way, I mean, and it's very interesting. I'm not sure I'm going to take those pills myself, but that's very interesting. Um, but point being is, this was an opportunity, and this, and this company, again, small company, doing great work. We're very excited to get this in the marketplace. Uh, I want to show this, because I talked about the tablets. Everybody's talking about iPad. By the way, I'm real excited, too. It launches on the 30th. Go get, like, seven. We're really good about it, okay? But the open tablet is going to full-fledged computer. It's a full-fledged tablet. One of the things we see in this, and OpenPeak, by the way, is a small company out of Florida. Um, they came to us with this at, at, at CES this year. And, and he walked in and said, I'm going to beat all the big guys and gals to the marketplace. Said, OK, show me how you're going to do that. And we are totally bought in. We announced this at CTIA, the partnership. 
I see this as what I call a personal or a home device. And the reason I say that is this is going to be sitting on a, on a cradle, I believe, in your kitchen. Okay, I've got a wife who works very hard in the home, and she's dealing with two kids who play sports and running around, and her whole life's around her computer. This will be her computer. By the way, when it's not her computer, it will be her picture frame. When she wants it, when we leave the house, she can take it, put it in her purse. It's a full-fledged tablet computer. She can do her email. She can actually look back at the house. There's going to be applications on this that are going to look and feel where she can decide, oh, I need to lock the doors. I need to do something, right, with a whole smart home. That's the concept we have with this. We launched some very cool things about taking your DVR with UVerse with you. Can you imagine a beautiful tablet like this when you're going on a plane? You can go watch. So it's going to be a multi-phase, multi-use tablet. We're excited about it. Again, I'm really excited that we're doing it with a company like OpenPeak because they are determined to be faster, smarter, better, and execute uh, at, at a higher velocity than some of the bigger players out there. And we, we're, all, we're, we're basically all in with them. Okay? Okay, a Cu couple more slides. So before I go there, why choose us? One of the things that's interesting as I was putting the team together was why AT&T? Like I got three big competitors plus a bunch of others out there that want to play in this space. And a couple of things that we sat down and said, how are we going to differentiate ourselves? First of all, we're GSM, that helps a lot, but there's other things. And when I went out and said, my CFO, Rick Linder, said, well, if you're relevant in fourth quarter, we'll talk about you. I said, great. And I, by the way, if you haven't noticed, I'm super competitive. So if you challenge me, I go, okay, re what's relevant to you? A couple hundred thousand numbers. We delivered over a million. And that was basically 11 months after my team was formed. Okay, how do we do that? Or how do we go so fast? And the point being is, is this is what we did. This is kind of our formula. And somebody says, well, why do you keep telling everybody your formula? Because I don't think anybody can match us. I mean, if anybody from Verizon's in the room, we can talk. But I know, I know, I know Tony, I, the whole team well. Bottom line is, is we're going out, number one, we, my boss calls us a startup. We're a very big company. And when Randall and Ralph said, this is what we need you to go do, I said, I need, I need to be able to break the rules. When we did the iPhone deal, we broke every rule in, internally. Okay, we had to because we didn't, you know, think about this. When, what, 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 if you guys realize this, if anybody in here has an iPhone, iPhone was the first phone ever to be launched with a full browser. Everybody realize that? Who owned the UI on, on the iPhone? Me or, me or Mr. Jobs? You probably can guess, Mr. Jobs, right? So I can go through a litany of things we did, new activation process, new rates, new, 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 new. Okay, we broke every rule, and we've done well with that, right? My concept is, look, I need a one-stop shop. So when I walk into an OEM, everybody that needs to make a decision is in that room. I don't need any more help from anybody else. If that partner says, I want to do a different business model, great, we're wide open to it. Wireless cares have not been known to be open to new business models, have we? Okay, every deal I just showed you, and I only showed you some, we've done about 25 devices in the last year plus. Every deal's unique, every deal's custom. Because that partner and I need to look at each other and say, yep, yeah, we think we can make this work, we both can make money, and more importantly than anything else, that we're going to deliver a great product to the customer. That's the most important, okay? So my team's basically looked at as a startup. I do get, i kind of been given the keys, and we're running, and we're doing things very differently than the rest of AT&T. Two, business model flexibility. Like I just said, I went to a healthcare alliance meeting in San Diego. There were 200 small businesses there, and they didn't know I was in the room yet, and there was a panel on the stage. And five of them got 10 minutes to talk about their device and what they were building for the healthcare world. Four of the five said the biggest issue they have is they don't think the wireless carrier will play. Four out of five. I was in the back corner. They don't know me. I got up next, and I, I got up right after them, and I said, okay, you four stand up. What's the problem? To explain to me why you think I'm the problem. Well, we need to, do, we need to make it invisible. Who, who, whoever has a Kindle in here, what do you pay when you buy the book for wireless connectivity? You don't know. No, you actually, you're paying. You just don't know it's there. It's $9.95 for a book. It's bundled in, right? Customers love that. It's simple. So my point to them was, I will look at any model you want me to. It's just got to be where I can make a reasonable margin, you can make your margin, and the customer's happy. That's all we care about. And I, I did a really not nice thing. I gave my healthcare guys phone number and email to all 200. <laughs> it was great. And then when Williams got hammered, it was terrific. But point being is, is we're not the problem because we, AT&T, will do whatever we have to do to make it work. We're, we're in a new business. It's a new place. It's a new world. We've got to do things differently. If you look also, it's very important, is our networks. Everybody's, probably one of the questions I'll get in two minutes here is about my networks. Okay, we have multiple sets of assets. 
and really, really, really important for everybody in this room and everybody in the United States is that every wireless carrier makes use of multiple types of networks. And you'll see up there, we obviously have our path to LTE and we have our 3G network and I can give you the commercial, right? But more importantly, we also have a huge Wi-Fi network, okay? 20,000 hotspots. If you go to Starbucks, that's us. If you go to Barnes & Noble, that's us. Why is that important? Because number one, for you, you don't really care what network you're on. Because you don't. You just want to make sure it's fast enough and the pipe's big enough to do what I want to do. What you care about is that it works. Okay? We love those because it offloads our 3G network. Right? We also, by the way, have 20 million, it's not on the slide, 20 million people in America that have our landline services and have, and many of them, the majority, have Wi-Fi. Very important to us. You can also think about, if you're an OEM, and I'll pick on Garmin. We, we've launched the 1690 with Garmin, which is a connected PND, portable navigation device. Do you think Garmin wants to be an international player? They already are. So Garmin said, well, we want to go with you because I have 192 countries where you get off the plane and your data just works. So I can give them a worldwide footprint, which was very, very important to customers. So we talk about our networks. That's a huge advantage for me. And last but not least is we're the only wireless carrier in the United States that has terrific relationships with every big national retailer that you can name. We do business with Costco, we do business with Walmart, Radio Shack, Best Buy, we do business with all of them. So if you build this great product and you have no place to sell it, it won't be a great product. And it's very, very important to you. So that has been my four things that we talk about. And the cool thing is it's worked. It's worked very, very well. Okay, so that's the slides I have. Do I have time for a couple of questions? Am I good? No one's saying no. So anything you want to chat about that I can talk about? <laughs> What questions do you have? Jim DeLong with um, Digital Society. Jim? Um, my question is, what's your revenue model here? Like, do you take equity stakes in these companies? It's a great question. Uh, the revenue model is, is going to be based upon the partner. So a couple of things we've done. Um, first of all, let me, let me kind of hit that two ways. Everybody realizes the last 20 years and maybe 25 of wireless business, it's about what? ARPU, right? Everyone wants to hear about ARPU, postpaid subs, churn. I don't care about any of that. My job is to deliver incremental shareholder value. Simple as that. Okay, so that's the first thing. Second thing is I'll do that any way I have to. So we may cut a deal in the ebook space that is simply bits and bytes. I sell bits and bytes because pick on Amazon. They take that. I make money every time you buy a book. Life's good. I may cut a deal with a different one who's smaller and not as big as Amazon that goes, look, I, I, I need a lower bits and bytes, but I'll share revenue on the book. Great. So we are cutting different business models with every single partner. And the reason we're doing that is because that's the only way for us to do this fast. It's the only way for us to be competitive, in my opinion. And so it's not something that AT&T has been good at in the past. But again, Ralph and Randall have given me the ability, and I've got lots of really good lawyers and lots of really good finance people who help me in getting these things done quickly. And so, to be honest with you, my, my 25 deals we've done, all over the board. I've got some rev shares. I've got some that's not. I've had partners come to me and go, this is what I have to have, have to do, have to, have to, have to. And I've gone, I don't love it. Math works. Fine. And after they launch, they come back and go, I was just kidding. I really didn't want that. I want this. All right, let's talk. I mean, look, I want to be a great partner. I want to have long-term relationships with these, with these companies. And to do that, we all had better be flexible. We all had better be willing to move. And if you're not, and you're going to be rigid, you're going to struggle in this space, because it's a brand new space. It's in its very, very infancy. So I hope that answers your question. Glenn, do any of those partners insist that you give them an exclusive to where you don't make your same network yeah. available to their competitors for some term? And when they ask for that, what do you usually say? Well, I say no really fast. Um, but let me, here's the hard part with that. You know, again, we are, here, you know, I'll give you a, a great example, okay? When we were doing the iPhone deal, one of the things I did really enjoy in the, in the negotiations was, you know, Apple's very confident in themselves, as you probably can imagine. And when you looked at all the other smartphones out there at that time, and think about this, three years ago, what good smartphone was there? BlackBerry. But BlackBerry was a business device. It wasn't a consumer device. So I mean, the coolest phone in the whole world five years ago was what? The Razor. Who had a Razor? We, right, the Razor launched Singular, right? That, that was the cool. And they told us when we, launched, when we lost this receiver and the Razor, Singular was dead. I've got articles that say that, right? What did the Razor do? It made phone calls. And then it broke. 
Don't tell, no, anybody from Motorola in here, I apologize. Okay, but that's just the way it is. So bottom line is, is we usually do it the other way, to your point. Exclusivity, you know, goes both ways. We are open to that depending on the partner. Most of the deals we've done, you know, we haven't gone there. We haven't needed to because reality is the fun part about my world is not, I'm not in the handset world, right? Somebody else does that, right? The fun part about my world is we're walking in trying to say, what's the model that works for everybody? And I know it sounds Pollyannish, and I get this all the time from people, and they go, Glenn, come on. Seriously, you're at and you got No, because if I take a small company, and I go in there and pound on them so they don't make money, guess how long they're going to be around? Then I've just wasted how much money going through the modeling process. By the way, I certify all these devices. You know, it's like certifying a device for the network. I got to make sure it works correctly. Very expensive. So the answer is this. You know, we have some relationships that are exclusive and some that are not. And the relationship has to be right for the partner. And the next question is going to be, what's going on with the iPhone relationship? And I can't tell you that, right? But obviously, that exclusivity for us and Apple has been very good for both companies. So. Uh, Mr. Laurie, I know, I know there's plenty more questions. I know you have to get on a plane back to Atlanta. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to thank you so much for your time today. Thank uh, you. I appreciate the time. I hope you guys have a great conference. Thanks.